They say all disasters are local. You guys are the first line of defense for your communities in any disaster, large or small. And when you declare a state of emergency, you're saying to us, we can't handle what we need to do by ourselves. We need state or federal resources. This declaration of emergency will allow you to move money around and things like that. I'm usually the one in the office that you're talking to on the phone when you call for resource requests, when you call to activate your EOC, when you tell us you've declared a state of emergency, when you need stuff put onto web EOC. I'm also here with Bob Berry. He's our local coordinator from the Region 3-4 office. What Bob does is he's the face you're going to see in your local EOC. He's the one that comes out. Um, is your MEMA person on the ground. Now when we talk about the disasters and activating your EOC, activation can go from just having a few people uh, by a phone to having a full-fledged EOC open with representatives from all your community departments. You bring them in once every four hours, once every six hours to get an update of what's going on. Um, we recommend, highly recommend, having an EOC having at least a place and some people designated um, to be the clearinghouse for information flowing into and out of your community. It helps us get resources <coughs> to you better. It helps take care of the paperwork better. And then declaring a state of emergency, you don't need to do it to qualify for federal funds, but it is something that if you do decide to do it, it, it won't hurt you. You don't have to declare a state of emergency to be eligible for FEMA funds if the state um, gets a FEMA declared disaster. Once the disaster exceeds the state's ability to handle the disaster, needs resources, needs federal aid, the state declares a disaster. That's where you get the governor's declaration of disaster. We get that out to you as soon as possible so you know what's going on. And then you've seen the process where afterwards we send out the FEMA PDA teams looking at um, the disaster. If your county has qualified, and you didn't declare a state of disaster, you are still eligible. Um, and basically, the information that we're looking for um, when we activate and when we're calling you is, you know, what do you need from us? That's the biggest question. What do you need? What resources do you need? Um, have you activated your EOC? Have you declared a state of emergency? How many um, roads have you closed? You know, do you have a lot of debris down? Do you, have you closed the schools so that we can get a picture of what's going on across the area and then how better to allocate resources? You can notify MEMA through Web EOC. If you have a Web EOC account, you're more than welcome. We, we um, encourage you to put all your information on Web EOC. Basically, that's activating and declaring an uh, emergency in a nutshell. Um, I'm here to talk about the public assistance program as a whole and a couple other um, various points on documentation. Here's just an overview of what the public um, assistance program is by definition in the Stafford Act according to FEMA. You know, you get reimbursed 75%. Here's a breakdown of the roles um, in the PA program. Uh, the uh, federal role, FEMA, um, is responsible for managing the program. This is their program. Um, they coordinate everything. We follow their rules. Um, the state, uh, we're what's called the grantee um, in the public assistance program. We're kind of like the liaison between you guys as the applicant and FEMA as um, the head of the program. And the applicants, which is you guys, um, you're responsible for um, really the, the nitty gritty stuff. Identifying what you want your projects to be, providing the backup documentation, um, and um, your, your ultimate cost will be based on what you guys submit to FEMA. Um, this is just a, a snake chart of what the public assistance program is as a whole. And if you take a step back and look at this whole picture, there are so many steps that lead up to it. It kind of gives you maybe a little bit more perspective on what goes into it on our end and FEMA's end before it gets to the ultimate um, goal, which is you guys getting your money. Just real quick. Um, the disaster happens. We do IDAs, which are initial damage assessments, followed by PDAs, which are preliminary damage assessments run by FEMA. We submit a request for declaration. It gets declared. Uh, we conduct applicant briefings in those counties that are declared. The applicants submit their applications, which is an RPA. Um, from there, 
FEMA will call each applicant and set up a kickoff meeting where they formulate each of your projects into what's called a project worksheet, a PW. Those projects get reviewed. Ultimately, they should be signed off on by you and FEMA. Once they get approved, FEMA gives us, the, as the state, as the grantee, the money for that project. Um, and then we, um, through a state standard contract, give it to you guys. Okay, here's a breakdown um, on the IDAs and PDAs, because these really drive the declaration as a whole. This is run by the state. This is what happens, the next step that happens after a disaster is declared. We have the regions do it for each of their communities <coughs> within their region. And it's just that Excel spreadsheet that you get as an attachment to fill out electronically, hopefully. It's an initial damage assessment, meaning that it's just estimates. One page for public assistance and one page for uh, residential business. During the IDA process, we don't need any backup documentation don't need any of your payroll, your time cards, anything like that at this point. These are just estimates. The primary purpose of an IDA is for the, us at headquarters, at MEMA headquarters, to get a glimpse of who by county is even remotely close to meeting the threshold that would be needed for a federal disaster declaration. You probably have gotten multiple calls from your region after you get an IDA saying, even if you don't have any damage, please submit something saying none. Um, that's just covering our bases, so we know we've reached out to everybody and we've tapped all resources to try to get your county included in the disaster declaration. We, when, we send the, when we send the IDA out, um, we try to send it out to the EMD, usually the DPW head, and the chief elected official. Okay, on the individual assistance side of the IDA form, that is done based on impacts, not numbers, not estimates, not dollar amounts. So that's where you really want to capture um, a more descriptive um, display of what is going on in your community. I do the IDA recording onto a massive spreadsheet back at headquarters. There's more room for error of me doing that when I'm getting 20, you know, 30 in at once, rather than just putting all of your departments on one IDA form. It automatically totals. All you do is go across the board. It automatically calculates at the bottom and then puts a total in there so you don't have to do any of the math. Um, it's more consistent that way. Um, go ahead. Uh, a few minutes ago, <coughs> when you said you sent it out to three different departments. So I was, I thought I was doing it for everybody, which is what you want, I guess. Right. But I didn't know that you could have gotten it from Understand. two other people. Right. It might be good to, when you get one, call your departments. I'll, I'll handle it. You send them to me. We'll put it onto one form or at least send them all together. Sometimes, I don't know if it's a follow-up or if it's a replacement um, to another previous IDA submitted. So if you guys are all talking, that might cut down on that too. I know it might seem like a short amount of time, the one week that we usually give. We do that because we're, we only have 30 days from the date the disaster happens to request a major disaster declaration to the president. There's about three or four steps, including this IDA, that have to happen before then. If you're off by a little bit when FEMA comes out to review, if they pick your town for a PDA, that's not gonna matter much. We just wanna know a ballpark figure of how much your town spent in eligible costs. This is what one should look like. Um, here's what the uh, residential business page looks like. Um, now when this comes to you, it's in one attachment, it's in one Excel spreadsheet with multiple tabs at the bottom. Do farms count as a business? When FEMA went around this after I read, they looked at the you know, the crop business building parts of farm separately from the residential building. Okay, okay, then yes. Um, the next step in the little slide chart, snake chart, was the PDAs, the preliminary damage assessment. This is the formal site visit with a FEMA and MEMA representative that come out to your town. What I'll do is pick, say, the top 10 or 15 most um, highest IDA reported amounts to for those towns to get a PDA visit. Um, the reason why we do that is because FEMA only needs to verify enough in dollar amounts for the county to make their threshold. That's the next step. That's how we get to who receives a PDA or not. Um, a PDA team is usually just a FEMA and MEMA representative that comes out to the town <coughs> and meets up with the local um, official from the community, whoever the MEMA point of contact is or whoever's available that day. They hop in the MEMA car and you drive them to the um, damaged sites. Typically, a PDA team um, will have to visit three towns in one day. So they usually have about two hours 
Um, here are some bullet points on the roles and responsibilities of the PDA team member from the town. Um, basically, like I said, to provide a list of all your sites and locations, but out of that list, identify the top, you know, 10 or 5 or 10 or however many you think would be able to be seen in, within the two hours that they're going to visit. You want to have the cost estimation data, whatever you put on the IDA, wherever you got those numbers from, have that paperwork available for the PDA because FEMA is going to want to look at it and verify those numbers. This is where the backup documentation is needed. Um, so you don't need this at the time of the IDA, but when we call you for a PDA, we usually give you at least a couple days notice that you're going to get a PDA. That's the time where you need to go back and gather your backup documentation, whatever you have. If you don't get a visit from us, a PDA visit in the county, don't be concerned about that. It, has no bearing at all on whether or not the town is going to get reimbursed. If we get the declaration in the state and you get the declaration from the county, it doesn't matter if anybody can look at your town or not, you are going to be covered under that declaration. Trust us, we, 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 we know the number we have to reach. <clears throat> We're just going to get to that in the most efficient manner that we can. Um, if you do get a PDA, it's a little bit more in-depth than the IDA, but it's still not a full-blown inspection of your site. So that's why FEMA doesn't like to give a number when they leave the town. And they still need to do the math and all that stuff. So don't be discouraged if they don't give you a number when they leave. <clears throat> Here's a quick little <coughs> chart of the el FEMA's eligibility structure under their PA program, which, like I said, NEMA just administers FEMA's PA program. So any rules that come down, even if they're told to you from me or Lorraine or whoever, it's really from FEMA's PA program that we're administering for them. How much are we going to get paid? When are we going to get paid? That's everybody's question, understandably. However, that is the last step in the process. It's the final <coughs> step that FEMA is going to look at as far as eligibility goes. They're first going to want to verify that you're an eligible applicant, which cities and towns, it's a no-brainer. It gets a little trickier when there's PMPs, uh, state agencies, tribal governments, things like that. They have to be verified. Um, but they're going to say, are you an eligible applicant? <clears throat> if you're submitting for a facility, was the facility eligible? Was the work eligible? And then finally, is your cost eligible? So, so yes. what happens if... Let's say um, on the on the public infrastructure side, the threshold for Franklin County is three hundred thousand dollars. What happens if we have an ice storm that the estimate is two hundred and fifty nine thousand dollars, and then we have a snowstorm that takes down a bunch of stuff, and there's two hundred and fifty nine thousand dollars more damage, but it's a separate emergency. And then we have a big rainstorm, and the whole thing floods because it melts all the snow and ice. Yeah, and it's another. 240,000, you know, what if you just miss the threshold? That's and right. And that's where something like impact statements would come into play greater than the numbers. <clears throat> if we can come up with some good impacts, we will request it. We're your advocate. We will put it into a letter. We'll make it sound as, as good as we can. Ultimately, it's FEMA's decision. Um, how does that work with snowstorms when you have snowstorm after snowstorm after snowstorm? No, if unfortunately, it's, it's a storms, you live in New England type thing. You're going to get snow. We can't give you money for every little snowstorm. But no. extreme, extreme circumstances where you've met your the snowfall is either record or near record, which is, I think, within 10% of the, then you'll be considered. If you made the threshold or if you made the snow or if you made this, then you're in. If you didn't, you're probably not going to get it unless your impacts are just So then the damage dollars don't. Um, a couple side slides on the RPA, which is this form right here, which you guys are all familiar with. This is the application, FEMA's application. Quick note, um, the primary <coughs> person on the RPA, which is going to be the person over here on the left-hand side, you always want to make sure that's the person who's going to have the initial contact with FEMA. That's the person that's going to coordinate all projects for all your all your projects at a time. You just want to make sure it's someone that's going to handle all the disasters. The alternate contact, we're really urging everyone to put your CFO down or whoever is going to sign your contract because this is who the contracts are going to get mailed to. Put the CFO on the RPA, but make sure you tell them you put them on the RPA. And make sure you say, hey, you're on the RPA. Be, be aware in a couple months you're going to be getting a ton of contracts coming to you. Sign them and return them ASAP because there are deadlines on those contracts. They do expire. But save a copy of that contract. It'll stay right on there. It's for DPW services, CAD A. Send a copy to the DPW department. This is for fire and police conduct. Send a copy to them. Make sure they're aware of it. Um, again, it goes back to internal <coughs> communications. That's the RPA. Um, facility eligible, eligibility requirements. It has to be located within a declared area. It has to be your legal responsibility as the town. Um, and it has to be in active use at the time of the disaster. It can't be an old abandoned shed that has nothing in it. 
along the same lines is the work. It has to be a direct result of the disaster that you're applying for, located in the d designated disaster area, so within the county. <coughs> FEMA's going to look at, did you use the cost codes? Did you use their schedule of equipment rates? Are, you know, are, you, are you asking for reasonable costs here? Um, you have to comply with the federal, state, and local regulations, and that's where they're going to bring up insurance and, and things like that. Um, just a quick note on applicant briefings and kickoff meetings. Um, applicant <coughs> briefings are what occur after the disaster has been declared. Sometimes in a bigger county like Berkshire and Worcester, we do one in the north, one in the south. And this is where you complete and hand in the IPA for most of the time, and that's where you want to make sure you bring the right people's contact information to put on the IPA or send send the right person to the um, to the applicant briefing. Kickoff meetings is where the FEMA rep is going to call that primary person and say, hi, I'm going to be your project specialist and I want to set up a kickoff meeting. When and where are you available? They're going to go over your emergency work <coughs> versus permanent work. They'll discuss the formulation of projects. They'll go over all you know, environmental, historical, <coughs> um, those issues. They'll give you the forms and they'll review timelines. Here's a slide on the types of eligible work, emergency work versus permanent work, category A and B, debris removal and emergency protective measures. Those are emergency work. You get six months. Categories C through G, which are listed there, you get 18 months. Um, again, this is all going to be reviewed to you, explained and reviewed during the kickoff meeting. FEMA usually brings a big binder or a pamphlet to give you. Here's just a quick snapshot of the timetables um, and also a reference to the time extensions, which comes into play way later down the road, um, but those can be requested through Rain Eddy if the work itself isn't going to be completed within this, this time period. Not for your project to get written, not to get paid, not to sign off, for the actual work to be done. If the work can't be done within these time frames <coughs> for these categories, that's when you request a time extension. Just a quick uh, small project versus large project, here are the <coughs> numbers, these are also things that change every October. Right now, the small project is 67,500 or less. Um, and that's a large project is greater than that. Small projects can be paid immediately. Um, we will ultimately need all the backup documentation related to it, but those can be paid, whether they're 0% or 100%. Large projects will only be paid based on actual costs incurred. So if you have 10% of a large project done, um, we'll pay whatever costs you have incurred and can show us backup documentation for. Just some notes on documentation. In the folder that I gave are some good um, forms that you can use this first one is the guide and checklist for submitting your project. This is probably going to be the most important thing that you guys take away from today if you're concerned about documentation. It's a checklist, literally, of everything that you would need to close out a project. Small, large, complete, incomplete. Make a copy of these. Make 20 copies of these. These are the FEMA forms. You'll probably recognize them as you go through with the Excel forms. Keep these in cards, keep them in your town offices. These are the things that you can do to prepare. As long as you document everything, even if it's in chicken scratch while you're out there, while the DPW guys out there or whatever, these FEMA forms are available electronically, pull them up, have that website bookmarked. Um, use these. This is what will make your life 10 times easier when it comes time <coughs> for you in the event a disaster gets declared. Even in the event it doesn't, it gets you in good practices. In the beginning, you're not going to know how everything's going to get broken up. But you know, okay, Main, Street's, it's pro Main Street is one project. It got washed out. You know you're going to need to repair it. Create a manila folder. Label it Main Street. Anything that relates to Main Street, whether it's who worked there, what contract you know you have in place, even if you in initiated one of the state contracts with Ashley <coughs> O'Brien for debris removal, make copies of that. Put it in that folder as you're doing it. And then when the time comes for FEMA to come and review, you just pull that folder. So the other things in this packet, I'll go over with you guys real quick, forms on the roles and responsibilities of the local. So this is really great. This is from FEMA's standard operating procedures. It lists your roles and responsibilities during a kickoff meeting. It lists your roles and responsibilities during project formulation, during documentation. Um, then the rest of the stuff in here is mostly fact sheets. Frequently asked questions on grant contracting because there's been a lot of contracts for mostly debris removal. Elements of a project worksheet, always good. If you're not familiar with the project worksheet, this breaks it down for you. Debris removal on federal aid highways, which this is about the new ruling. I'm not sure how aware you guys are of this, that now FEMA will pick up debris removal on federal aid highways. Not MassDOT, not the ER program. So it's good news. You're going to be able to just combine everything and 
uh, FEMA will reimburse debris removal on federal aid roads starting as of October 1st of this year. Like 91. Just for the yeah. reimbursement side of it. Do everything you're doing the same, but as far as when you have to submit to reimbursement, it can all go to FEMA if there's a declared disaster. The permanent, work, the permanent work is still is still going to be ER. This is just for Category A debris removal okay. that FEMA picks up. So the permanent work is still good. 100, yeah. 180, and you guys are all 75. I mean, yeah. FEMA's all 75. Yeah. So right. it's a much better program. So know which ones are yours mm -hmm. because those roads get a lot better reimbursed. Okay. The, the permanent work isn't as hard to separate out. You know the contracts were in. For, it's when the debris removal, what truck went down, what road, that and was we, hard to separate out. So that. you don't have to worry about that anymore. Yeah, we did All that too. The <coughs> removal on both, yeah. and it was difficult. Mm -hmm. but we um, there's a couple fact sheets in here on debris removal from waterways and private property. Just Who owns the debris in the river? That's typically going to be an NRCS issue. NRCS can only touch it if it is threat. Is stream threat. bank stabilization. If it's on the stream bank and you're doing a project, they'll, then you can remove it. If it's in the river behind rocks, and the, they're not working in the river. But as far as the debris thing, we got a lot of negative feedback from you guys um, saying it's too hard to separate out our federal aid roads. This is impossible. Now, I know that has been an issue in the past disasters, and it just wasn't something that I don't think FEMA had something in place for to mediate. Thank you. Um, okay. All right. We have about five minutes from the map. Okay. And I'm Bill Arable. I'm from the Division of Local Services at the Mass Department of Revenue. I want to talk to you tonight about three statutes in Chapter 44. Um, the first one is Section 31, which is an old law. It's been around for a long time. It hasn't been modified. Um, chapter 44, Section 8-9, which is also an old law, but it was modified last February. And then 44-8-9-A, which is a new law as of February. If there hasn't been a vote authorizing you to spend money, you know, either by raising appropriation or borrowing, you can't spend it. But in the case of emergencies, you're allowed to get around that. 4431, you can spend, you can authorize spending in case of an emergency. Um, you do have to notify my boss, who's the director of account. The chairman of the board of selectmen would write in for permission to spend without appropriation. So you just send in a form letter and you send it back or, you know, an approval letter. The board would have to decide whether they want it to be an open approval or if they want to cap it. <clears throat> now, in some towns, they wrote um, multiple letters to us. Okay. You know, they'd write one letter for two hundred thousand, they'd come back for another four hundred thousand, and then they'd come back for an additional three hundred thousand. Some other towns just basically threw their hands up in the air and said, "Give us an open approval letter," and that's what they got. Okay. In some cases, the DPW director was able to. Um, come up with a rough estimate for the entire cost of damage to public property. The town hall buildings, the school buildings, the roads, the bridges. And this also applies, besides cities and towns, this also applies to the districts. Fire, water, sewer districts. We're really referring to districts where they have tax rates. Mm -hmm. And if, if you don't really need it, do you write in and say never mind? Um, what happens is, is that our Bureau of Accounts field rep will contact you later in the year saying, you know, what, what, what's happening here? Do you, you know, do you need to borrow? Where are you at? You could either send them a short email or just tell them when they come out to visit you. It turns out we were able to spend within our budget. Okay. Um, then emergency appropriations borrowing. Now, at least as long as I've been around, towns have had the authorization to borrow for emergencies. Prior to the tornado, we were talking about strictly for operations. And that is what 4489 is for. It's for debris removal. It's for emergency work. And with the ice storm, you started to see towns that were forced to write in to get special legislation, to get a special act, to extend the term of borrowing for the town's share. When we got into the tornado, we realized that th that model wasn't going to work. It wasn't going to be about one or two towns writing in for special legislation. It was going to be several. But as a precaution, they extended the term of borrowing from two up to 10 years. And basically what you'll do is you'll send in 
a schedule to the director, you know, how you're going to pay it off over so many years. Now, again, though, we're talking about emergency costs, emergency repairs here under 4489, as opposed to permanent capital costs. That's basically what we were dealing with up until 2011. We were looking at debris removal. We were looking at emergency costs. With the June, t June tornado, we saw heavy capital damage. We saw major long-term structural damage. So what they decided was they came up with a new statute under 4489A where a town, city, or district could borrow for long-term capital damage where they had two options. If, say they lost a bridge. They could go to town meeting and vote to authorize the borrowing for the bridge work. Unfortunately, what we saw in 2011, you had towns that were so damaged, they didn't even have the capacity to hold a town meeting. Yeah. You can't hold a town meeting where there's no town hall. Yeah. They came up with an option where the town officials could write into the Municipal Finance Oversight Board for authorization to spend for capital costs. Okay. So far, only one city has done that. And they put in an application, and then they withdrew it and decided, to go, and they decided that they would go to city council instead. Uh -huh. But there is a recognition that there are times when town meeting and city council are not an option. And basically, what it is is the term of borrowing for the replacement of a bridge would be, or a road would be the same as what is allowed under Mass General Laws. You know, if you've lost the town hall, you can borrow for up to 30 years. So the terms are the same depending on what the capital item is. If you don't remember anything else that I tell you tonight, please remember this. How soon you should, should you contact the Department of Revenue after the disaster occurs? As soon as possible. <coughs> you know, put down our contact <coughs> information if you're writing into us, if you're sending in by FedEx. Um, got the names and phone numbers of who to call, email addresses. Now we get into the other issue is funding that spending. Some towns were able to tap into their reserves. Some towns, they came to us right away and said, yes, you've given us approval to spend without appropriation, but we don't have any cash. In that case, what they would do is they would write, this, they would write in for approval to spend and borrow and the 4489. That's a, it's okay. not for the permanent work. It's only in the emergency that you're talking, We're talking about. You the can emergency. Kind of but when you talk about replacing the whole road, replacing the bridge, that's a permanent cost. That's a capital cost. The thing I'm interested in is that if it takes another two or three years, well, we've been able to amortize some of that money, but we're rolling over at, at admittedly a very low interest rate. That, that interest payment is, is subtracted from the reimbursement total, the yes, aggregate. That's going to just be appropriated. You don't yes. get anything for that. That's just, that's yours, and you're on the hook for it. And, and even, even at less than a percent, which is what we're getting. Yeah, we're at 0.05. A million dollars at less than a percent. Two million dollars less percent. It's, it's still a chunk of change. It's a lot of money. Yeah. It is. And that, you're on the hook for it. Plus, every time you, you know, you'll pay for your bond counsel, so you'll run up several thousand dollars in financial administrative advisory costs as well. Now you, so, can, you can roll the issuance costs into the interest costs, and you can set, have the note mature in the next fiscal year for budgetary purposes. Okay, I guess we're all set to talk about how to use that money. The emergency procurement laws that I'm going to talk about are the state laws. When you're talking about um, federal procurement, typically state procurement in Massachusetts is more onerous than federal procurement. So if someone tells you, oh, you need to follow federal procurement laws, don't get too worked up about that, because um, typically if you, if you follow state procurement laws, you are, you are doing even one step beyond what federal procurement asks for. Um, and they talk about Davis-Bacon wages instead of um, mass prevailing wages. Typically, mass prevailing wages are higher than, than federal wages, so you're probably going to be okay there. So that's just a aside before I get started. Before you get into the position of having to do an emergency procurement, it's a good idea to know the basic laws about regular procurement. 
And some of you are going to designate your town administrator to be the, the guru for this. But I think anyone who's signing off on contracts and, and um, taking some responsibility for this ought to know the basics of Massachusetts procurement. Um, there's a free course now that's available um, online from the Inspector General's office called the Bidding Basics. Um, and if you haven't gone through the entire, if you're not trying to become an MCPPO or, or become a procurement guru, this, um, this little course that they have will give you pretty much everything a town select board member or somebody like that would need. So I recommend doing that. The other thing that you should have before an emergency strikes is to have a policy for how you're going to do procurement in an emergency. It, depending on how your town is set up, in this case the town administrator um, is going to designate department heads to do emergency procurement and going to give them the authority to do that. And, and that town administrator is going to make sure that those department heads do know this basic procurement stuff. So the four laws that what you're going to get involved with, with any kind of procurement, and you may get involved with any of these in an emergency, um, are Chapter 30B, which is the, the one that most people are the most familiar with. <coughs> That's for buying items, goods, and services. When you are faced with an emergency and you need to buy items or procure a service, you don't have to get a waiver from any um, state agency. And I'm talking about severe emergencies. The health and safety of people are immediately in danger. Then you can kind of skirt some of the 30B requirements, which are um, either three quotes for anything from five to 25,000 and a sealed bidding process over 25,000. Some examples of that might be some big blizzard, you, you bust your plow. And you've got to have a new plow, and you've got to have it now. <coughs> People are going to be in danger. They won't be able to get out of town. Um, so you could use your emergency process to buy a new plow without going up to bid, even though it's over $5,000. You just have to document what you did. One of the things that the Inspector General likes to say is, make sure you're not getting taken. I mean, you've got to be reasonable. Go to your DPW guy and say, you know, what is a reasonable cost for this plow? Because you, you don't want to spend more than you have to. Um, maybe, your, maybe your town that has a water treatment plant and your water treatment plant gets ruined and people don't have um, safe drinking water. You might need to go buy an entire truckload of Polar Spring, Polar Spring water to deliver to people right away. Um, maybe you have a water main break um, and it's, it's not a uh, 39M public works project because maybe your DPW department is going to take care of it, but you've got to go out and buy all that pipe and you've got to have it now. Um, that would be another reason you could use 30B um, emergency practices. Um, 3039M are public works projects. That's where the, that's the procurement law for public works. Um, in uh, public works, the, the definition of emergency is slightly different. They talk about sabotage, enemy attack, hostile actions. Basically, if it's a catastrophe, you know, it's, it's a, it might be a 3039M public works emergency. And you might think a tower is a public building because it's vertical. But actually towers are public works projects. And they come under 3039M and not building construction. So if you had a communications tower that went down and, and you, were, you were, couldn't talk to anyone, you could have emergency work done on that under 3039M. That would be what it would be under. So, where it says you need a DCM waiver, certainly you can get started on your, on, your, on your project to get yourself back going, but as soon as reasonably possible, you have to apply <coughs> to DCAM um, for a waiver. And it's, it's, a, it's a phone call and a fax from them. But 30 is the only one you don't have to get um, some kind of waiver for. However, somebody needs to have a record of what you did. Um, so if you bought something over that $25,000 bid limit and you used your, your town's policy, um, you need to write that up and send it to the Secretary of State's office, Goods and Services Bulletin, just like you would if you were going out to bid for something. So anyone who's going out to bid for large <coughs> items is familiar with Goods and Services. They have a section for um, notifying about contracts that you did under, under emergency. You have to remember that all you can do with emergency public works procurement is temporary re temporarily repair and restore the service to preserve the health and safety. Um, you can't take this as an opportunity. Let's say this 
tower went down, and um, it was kind of an old tower to begin with, and you had to fix it so that you could have emergency communication, you just can only fix it. You can't take this as an opportunity. Well, I've got the tower guys out there. They came all the way out from Boston. I might as well just have them, you know, upgrade it and put this new thing on it that we need. You can't do that. But you certainly bring it up to current codes and, you know, current usability. Always, Always pay prevailing never, wages. We're never, gonna get to that. Um, no we're gonna get to that. Uh, you should have a isolated repair work prevailing wage um, in your office always. And you should get it renewed before it expires. Because you might be um, forced into using it in a hurry and you won't have time maybe to go to the Department of Labor and get a new schedule. So um, that's, that's going to come into effect. Um, you're still gonna have to use uh, repairmen who are OSHA certified. Um, you don't want anyone working on your stuff that hasn't had at least the 40 hour OSHA training because you know, they, may not, they may not do it in a safe manner. So um, you, need, you need prevailing wages OSHA and you will need to get a uh, bond from these folks might not get it immediately before they start working on the repair work, but you're not excused from getting a payment bond for um, larger projects. Um, likely, DCAM will give you a waiver for advertising. That's, that's the most um, common thing that they will waive, is the two, you know how you normally have a two-week advertising um, <coughs> schedule? Or um, might need to put something into the central register? They, they will probably tell you in an emergency that you don't have to do that, but they're not going to waive prevailing wage, and they're not going to waive OSHA, and they're not going to waive getting a bond. So 149 um, is the other procurement law that covers building construction. Typically, we talk about building construction as being a vertical construction. The only time it's not is towers and uh, wastewater treatment plants. Those are public works. Um, but buildings that people go into and use at 149 projects. Um, you can purchase under emergency conditions when, once again, health and safety of people or property or in security threat. It's the only way you can get around doing the full uh, building construction procurement, which does involve typically, you know, central register posting and, um, the, you know, the, the full two weeks. Um, and I wanted to point out that um, 149 building construction always also covers things like replacing a window or electrical repair or replacing a heating system. Anything that's permanently affixed to the building and you need to repair it is building construction. So don't get thinking building construction is just like roofs and actually building a, a structure. And once again, you need to call DCAM um, and get a waiver to, to expedite the uh, work under that. Um, you're definitely going to have to get someone right away to stabilize the situation. Go ahead and do that, but just remember that um, you're going need, to need to make sure that um, you get them that set of prevailing wages so that they're paying their folks properly during the, during the process, because it's hard for them to go back and, and change the way they do their wages after the fact. Mm -hmm. They really need it right up front, so keep that isolated repair schedule. It's basically something the Department of Labor puts out that gives you every <coughs> possible kind of labor that anyone would do. It's very, very long, um, but everything's in there, so just keep that on hand and so you can hand that over to somebody when they come in to do that work. Probably not typically needed in an emergency, but um, I did run into it and help a town with it this year was under Chapter 7 Designer Selection, and that's Architects and Engineers. Um, you can expedite the designer selection process, once again, when people are in danger or um, there's a, a deadline for action that a court has set for you. You can select from any standing list of designers who have applied for projects of a similar nature. So if you, if you know of another um, school roof building project that happened, um, you could use their list of architects or you could use a standing list of um, approved architects that you find on a state bid list or any standing approved list that somebody else has gone through a process. Um, you can use that. So that could, um, that could be a, a good way to do it and then you just um, select one from there. I think that covers all the mass general laws. 
just to go back, just to remind you that under 5,000, you weren't required to do a formal procurement process anyway. So small emergency projects, you just do what you normally would do. Um, normally, that's the, called best business practices. Some towns have an internal policy that over $2,000, they like to get three quotes. That if that's your town policy, um, then, you know, that, that's different than what I'm telling you here, which is the state law 30B. And I think the main thing to take away from this is keep good records uh, of who you asked. Because if someone comes back, back especially if, there was, if there's an allegation of conflict of interest later on, if you have some rec written records of saying, you know, I, I, I called up this gravel company and this gravel company and you know, these guys weren't available, just keep a record of it. And then if the brother-in-law got the project, you know, you have a record that you, that you did the best you could. And this talks about how the waiver happens. It's, it's, a, it's a fax that they send you back. Um, and it might not be a complete waiver. They might say, you know, it's an emergency, but you could advertise for one week instead of two weeks. Once again, prevailing wages are still required, OSHA, and put it back the way it was, for safety's sake. And under a $10,000 design project would not have required you to do a formal process anyway. So this is just for the emergency uh, procedures I'm talking about only kick in for a big project, over $100,000 and over $10,000 for a designer. Some other ways to get emergency things or services, um, the statewide contracts. There are some uh, uh, plumbers and electricians out here, I've noticed, um, that, are with, that are Western Mass folks. Using the Compass system, if you've never used it, um, to try to find a statewide contract and search for it, it's, it's not Google, folks. <laughs> it's not intuitive. Um, I think for people who aren't used to searching under it, having a list like this is better. You just, just call somebody up and say, you know what, what I need isn't exactly what you have, but I bet you know who I should talk to, and they'll just transfer you over. Um, if you have some uh, emergency that, that's uh, related to highway things, roads, you know, FERCOG has highway bids in place cooperatively for uh, 23 towns in the county. Um, and, you know, we can get prices through that for you. We have, you know, standing in place prices for gravel, and, you know, guardrails, and everything you might need for, for that. Also, within the last couple of years, it's become um, available to towns to use the federal GSA um, purchasing schedules which are actually very, very good competitive prices. They beat out the state contracts every single time I've looked at them, every time. There's a disaster recovery icon when you go on there for items that are available to you under disaster recovery, and there's a lot of items. It's a, just, it just says disaster recovery, and it's a little colored thing after each vendor. So as you're going through that e-library and looking for things, and I recommend you do it before there's an emergency. Go through and see what they have. Uh, you can buy anything that has that icon after it. And uh, they have um, expedited delivery processes and, and things to help you out. This is also a, a contact person, Peter Sullivan. He's our rep in uh, this area of the state. Once again, I, in an emergency, I think it's better just to call him up and say, Peter, what do you have? What can you do for us? My experience has been that if a town makes a really good faith effort to, to do as much competitive searching for things as they can, uh, try not to get taken, try to stay away from perceived conflicts of interest, um, you'll be all right. You know, I may not know all the answers, but I have all the resources. You know, give me a call and, and I will um, do the very best I can. <laughs>
uh, and interpretation of the law. So uh, a good place to go if you've got questions. And just a suggestion, we're talking about emergency meetings tonight. Yeah, I would just suggest that if you have a question about whether or not you have an emergency that's worthy of an emergency meeting, you might want to give town council a call. It might be the, the best money that you, you spend. But I don't want to say any more about town council because they have a way of hearing that you're thinking about them and billing you for those hours. <laughs> so just a, a little bit of discussion about uh, the, the normal course of procedure for uh, open meetings. Um, and we're really, when we're talking about emergency meetings, we're, we're really talking about the notice that's required for a meeting. <coughs> Uh, because the 48 hours notice uh, is something that, that can get waived. But everything else stays the same. All meetings of public bodies must be open to the public. And there's certain instances where you can uh, go into executive session <coughs> and kick everybody out that uh, doesn't need to be there, but you have to start a meeting in open session. 48 hours notice is required, although you can't include Saturdays, Sundays, and legal holidays. Notices must now be accessible to the public 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, there's certain uh, ways that you can meet that requirement. Uh, most of us probably have a, either a lighted bulletin board outside our town halls now or perhaps uh, posting on your website. But I just wanted to, to say too that the, the last bullet there, um, your <coughs> notice on your agenda has to be relatively detailed. You don't have to include everything, but everything that you reasonably anticipate will be discussed. If things come up between the posting and your meeting, it's okay to talk about it. So in the open meeting law, the definition of an emergency, there's a two-pronged test there in essence. It has to be unanticipated, and it has to require an immediate response. We're really talking about that 48-hour window. That's where you need to decide you know, locally, and this could be an instance where a call to town council is in order before you make the decision. Generally what we're talking about, what we've heard tonight, are, are you know, circumstances, emergencies that are, uh, you're going to need to meet in order to protect public safety and or the public health. The 48 hour notice requirement is waived if you need to declare an emergency meeting. But you do need to post the meeting as soon as reasonably possible. You know, you need to list the items that you're going to, to talk about in that meeting. Can you just go up there and scotch tape this meeting up there and, and, and write the time you put it on there and do the best you can it. as soon as reasonably possible. Okay. Only discuss emergency topics. You don't want to start talking about an employee's job performance in the water department, even if it's an employee who might have caused the, the water main break. Because presumably <laughs> you've got some time after you fix this immediate emergency situation to then go back properly post, give notice as you're required to under the open meeting law to the employee and then go through the proper procedure. And you don't need to have a declared emergency to do it. It's just an unanticipated event comes in. Yeah, you don't need to declare an emergency. It's one of the items on your on your test. Yeah. So, holding an emergency meeting is not an appropriate thing if you've just overlooked a deadline or if something kind of got forgotten. It requires, requires an immediate response, but it, it certainly wasn't unanticipated. <laughs> the open meeting law does now allow for remote participation. Uh, the board should vote to adopt remote participation if you want to. Um, you can add restrictions within the law. You can decide what types of allowable technology. You know, do you just want to allow a phone call? You want to use Skype? You can limit the number of meetings per year where it's allowable. You can define a certain geographic distance away from the meeting room if you'd like. You know, maybe across town is not good enough. But if there's a road washed out and you can't physically get to the meeting, a quorum of the board must be physically in the meeting room for someone to, else to participate remotely. And that's essentially what I had to say about holding emergency meetings. Wow. Going to the Attorney General's Open Meeting Law website is a really good place to learn a lot more information about the Open Meeting Law in general. I like that.